Hi, welcome everybody to Naturally Speaking with Jess Mullins and Patricia Simpson. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes past six o'clock to give people time to finish their dinners and get home from work. So go ahead and grab some water, use the restroom, get cozy, and we'll get started really soon. Welcome folks. If you just joined us, we're going to get started in just a few minutes past six o'clock to give people time to get home from work. Um, go ahead and grab some water, get comfortable, and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Thank you. Is this where I should be playing Flight of the Bumblebee <laughs> to entertain people? <laughs> Better than the Jeopardy music, that's for sure. <laughs> If you just joined us and are itching to get started, I wanted to go ahead and put your name in the chat. And um, one thing that you love about either bees or plants. Don't be shy. Patricia and Jess, this goes for you too. <laughs> Oh, chat is disabled. Okay. Thanks for letting me know, Craig. Um, you put that in the Q&A. Dan, could you maybe look at um, enabling the chat for folks? I will try. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, one way we can get around that, of course, is if you have questions for Jess and Patricia, you actually can put that in the Q&A box, like Craig did, to let us know the chat was disabled. It's oh, working Patty. Now. Okay, perfect. Working. Awesome. Thanks, folks, for letting us know. Um, so again, as we're waiting just another minute or so for folks to log on, why don't you go ahead and put uh, your name in the chat and something that you really like about either bees or plants. And for those of you who just logged on, we're just giving people a few minutes here um, to get in the Zoom room and to get situated. So go ahead and grab some water and get comfortable and we will get started in one minute. Patricia, ditto, fuzzy butts. Bee butts are so cute. <laughs> There's actually an Instagram uh, page, I think, that just focuses on on bee butts. I can't remember <laughs> what the handle is, but it's just all they post is pictures of bee butts. I am going to look that up as soon as we hang up tonight, because <laughs> if, if anything is going to make you feel better after a hard day or a sad day, it's looking at fuzzy little bee butts. Exactly. 
Yes, Adam, when bees fall asleep and mellow flowers. I think you were the one who pointed that out to me, actually, little sleeping bumblebees and the mellow flowers. So cute. Um, love it. And on that note, there's actually a iNaturalist project um, for sleepy, slum sleepy slumber parties for bees that gather together on, on blooms and sleep. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> I know. Nature is amazing and also adorable. <laughs> you can appreciate nature for nature for its scientific intricacy. And you can also appreciate how adorable it is sometimes. <laughs> um, we have some great answers in the chat here, folks. Uh, we are going to get started, though. And thank you so much for sharing what you love about bees and plants while we waited for folks to log on. Um, well, hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Sam Wins. I'm gonna be your host. I'm a scientist and science communicator out at Cabrillo National Monument. And tonight I'm really excited um, to introduce you to two amazing women who are doing incredible work out there promoting native biodiversity here in this incredible biodiverse place of San Diego County. Uh, but before we do that, we have just a few housekeeping items. Um, so this is a webinar format, as you may have noticed. You're not going to be able to see the participants, only the hosts and the panelists, okay? Um, that's that's normal. There's nothing wrong with your computer or, or with Zoom on your end. Um, to ask questions, some of you had already um, found the Q&A button. It's either going to be, depending on your computer, at the top of your screen or down at the bottom. Um, so you use that function. You can ask questions at any time. In fact, cue them up as they're talking so that you don't forget your question, right? Um, and at the end, I'm gonna read your questions aloud um, to our panelists, our speakers today for them to answer. And you can also use the chat function now that we've enabled it um, to answer any questions that Patricia and Jess may have for you as we go along or you know, even to chat, chat amongst yourselves, right? As, as they are speaking. Um, please keep your mic muted. Um, just there's a lot of people on this call. It can get a little chaotic. And um, captions are available by clicking the closed caption icon either at the bottom of your Zoom screen or again at the top of your Zoom screen, depending on where your bar is. All right. And all that is to say, we're getting started here. Um, I'm going to stop my share so that they can start sharing their screen. And um, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you. Um, first, I'll introduce Patricia. Uh, Patricia is a coworker of mine um, and just an amazing naturalist here in San Diego, one of the iNaturalist power users. I learn so much from her every day about um, plants and about insects um, and about San Diego's biodiversity. Um, and so Patricia is now the vegetation technician at Cabrillo National Monument. And she has been doing some work alongside the incredible entomologist Jess Mullins, who is with the David Holway Lab at uh, UCSD. Um, and I'm going to let them speak to on the work that they're doing, um, and all the exciting stuff they have to share tonight. So without further ado, um, Jess and Patricia, please take it away. Thank you for that introduction. I'll share my screen and let Patricia get started. All right. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is a lot of fun to have that. Um, um, a little bit about myself, as uh, Sam said, I am the vegetation technician at Cabrillo National Monument. Uh, what that means is that I do native plant propagation and habitat restoration at Cabrillo. Um, it, hopefully uh, most of you are aware that we have a greenhouse um, at, just outside of the park, uh, but if not, we do, and we grow a lot of plants there. Um, I am lucky to have a lot of volunteers uh, there that are helping me. Uh, we do everything from seed collection in the park uh, to planting, growing the plants and planting them back into the field. Uh, this week, we've been working on uh, the road uh, that leads to the lighthouse, and we've been doing uh, putting a lot of new plants there. So if you're in the park, check it out. Oh, trying to advance my slide. It's not working. 
Oh, there it is. So um, I um, I'm an avid naturalist. And what that means is I love to go out in the field and take photos of just about everything I can find and try to identify them. Um, and for that, I use iNaturalist. I've been doing this since about 2015. And in 2016, I met uh, the amazing Dr. Kang Lu James Hung, um, who was and still is the bee specialist um, in San Diego. He's no longer in San Diego. He works outside. Um, but he still is the person that has discovered the most amount of bees in um, San Diego County. And Jeff is taking over uh, uh, and stepping in his footsteps and doing a, an amazing job. And with uh, James, I started a um, project on iNaturalist called Bees of San Diego County to kind of keep track of um, the native bees here in San Diego and how they're doing and where they're found. And um, in, since 2021, um, with his help and with also Jess's help, uh, we've been doing uh, native bee surveys at Cabrillo National Monument. Um, and I will be talking a little more about that uh, later, um, but this is very exciting. We're hoping to learn uh, a lot about the bees If you want to advance, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Jess Mullins, and I'm currently a PhD student at UC San Diego in Dr. David Hallway's lab. And I joined in 2021 to study how land use change impacts which bees are found where in San Diego County. And I started my process in learning the very diverse bee fauna in San Diego on iNaturalist from a few states east in Colorado. So um, I've been lurking for a while and I'm happy to be a part of it now. Um, and I wanted to start today by talking about a bee that many of you are maybe familiar with. This is the bee that most people have heard of and that's the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera. And it is prolific in Southern California um, but it is not native to the Americas. It was introduced in the 1600s um, but for wax, um, and then it became a very important um, pollinator for our crops, and it has also successfully moved into a lot of places, um, especially in Mediterranean climates. So this map shows us uh, the exotic range in red and the um, native range in blue, purple, and the density of wild colonies, so not managed colonies, those living out free um, in Africa and Europe. And um, oftentimes we hear about bee decline and this is the bee that comes to mind, but the managed colonies are, are maybe the ones that are at risk, but those living in the wild are, are not at risk. And to give you a sample of how uh, prevalent they are. There's a really great iNaturalist project called Nesting Bees, and this also tracks nesting bees that are honeybees, unmanaged colonies. And just in North America, there are 3,500 observations of nests, and you can see they'll live in inside of old power line poles in water control boxes. Um, and their prevalence is further shown by they're the third most observed organism in San Diego County. and um, a lot of people don't spend time staring at flowers looking for bugs, so that's how prevalent they are. Um, every People notice them enough to put them on iNaturalist. And um, an interesting pattern that Dr. James Hung noticed during his PhD at UC San Diego was not just their prevalence, but how often they're visitors of flowers. So this map shows different network studies, so that is just a big list of pollinators that visit plants. And um, the uh, orange color shows the percentage of those flower visits are honeybees. And you'll see the most orange in Southern California, where we are, and also in other Mediterranean areas. So um, they're prolific floral visitors here, and they are directly correlated with the floral abundance. So if there are a lot of flowers, the honeybees have this amazing ability to communicate to their sisters, hey, there's a really delicious patch over here of flowers to eat. Um, they do an amazing dance called the waggle dance and all of their sisters go and forage. Um, so if it's one flower that's out blooming by itself, 
Um, maybe a honeybee will visit it, but not tell the world about it because there's not much to eat. But um, if it's like this photo is um, when baccarus was in bloom in the fall, that was the only thing blooming and there was a lot of it. So there were lots of honeybees on it. Um, and another thing that we hear a lot of with honeybees is about the skewed a lot of hybrid. So a lot of people often call this the Africanized honeybee, but um, the skewed a lot of hybrid is a more accurate term because the continent of Africa has many subspecies of honeybees and the skewed a lot of hybrid was one that was brought to South America because it is more robust um, and less impacted by disease. And um, there has been concern since the 80s that it was moving north. And so Dr. Daniela Zarate, who was a PhD student at UC San Diego, studied the genomics of these bees. So basically, what is their, she called her project 23andB, and she looked at the genome of all of the bees to see um, just what percentage of it was skewed a lot of hybrid. So you'll see each bar is the genome of a of one bee specimen. And from San Diego County, you'll see an admixture. So it's not just this skewed a lot of hybrid. Um, it's a hybrid of um, also different genomes from around the globe. So that brings us into talking about what is a bee. And a bee is a vegetarian wasp. So in the early Cretaceous period, um, over a hundred million years ago, these wasps that would visit flowers to collect thrips. So you gardeners here probably know and maybe don't greatly appreciate thrips visiting your flowers or living in your flowers, but these wasps would clean them up and take the thrips back to their nest to lay their egg on. And in the process, it slowly became advantageous that this pollen covered thrip had a pretty delicious meal on it, and that was pollen. And that's when bees emerged to switch their diet to pollen. And bees, much like monarch butterflies, go through complete metamorphosis. They are adults that lay an egg with this pollen provision. And then they have several larval stages, a pre-pupa and a pupa winter. Uh, they overwinter underground usually like this, and then they emerge in as, as an adult and start the process all over again. And bees are so important because they are very efficient pollinators. Mo there are many pollinators that are so important. Bees are special pollinators because they visit flowers specifically to collect pollen, while other pollinators visit flowers to drink nectar, and in the process, they get pollen on them. And 80% of flowering plants require animal pollination to reproduce. And without pollinators, a third of plant species would not be able to reduce to produce seeds at all, and half of the plant species would have a reduction in their fertility, so their offspring wouldn't be as fit. So knowing exactly how they're changing in response to land use change and climate change is crucial to promote their biodiversity and protect our ecosystems. And uh, my favorite uh, fact to talk to people about about bees is that there are over 20,000 bee species globally, and we have just hit over 700 in San Diego County. So this is a very diverse area for bees, um, and they come in all shapes and forms and life history traits. So um, when I said I love the diversity of bees before the talk started, this is what I meant. I, I appreciate all of their forms and behaviors. And um, most bees are actually solitary. They don't have a queen or workers that they communicate with. They um, lay an egg in a nest, close it off, and they never meet their offspring. Um, and some 13% of all bees are parasitic. And that means that a bee lays an egg in another bee's nest and uh, the parasite's egg hatches and eats the provision of the host and um, that's their life cycle. And this picture, it looks like a wasp, but this is actually a bee following um, a mining bee into her nest to lay an egg. And she's a bit of a freeloader. And finally, social bees, which we've heard a lot of that about with queens, workers, this um, organized cast of, of organized labor. That's only 9% of species. 
That said, because their colonies are so large, the abundance of these social species is high, particularly around the tropics. And most bees live underground. There are soil excavators like uh, this chimney bee here, but there are also wood excavators that can uh, dig holes in or build holes inside of wood. I see that commonly around palm trees around here. Um, they, there are mason bees that will make uh, collect pebbles and mud and resin to build a little cell above ground. Um, there are renters that will go to different cavities. Um, and this is something Patricia will get into with um, not necessarily trimming everything in your garden because you're supporting bees. And then there are brood parasites that will nest above or below ground, depending on their host. And another trait that's very special about bees is some are very picky eaters and they will only visit one type of flower. So sometimes in only one family of plants, sometimes one genus to collect pollen. And then there are generalists. And you can see in this yellow faced bumblebee, she stopped over at a flower that had yellow pollen and then went on later to collect purple pollen. So they aren't so picky, they will collect pollen from whatever is blooming. And um, more about the biodiversity hotspot that we live in, the California Floristic Province, we're uh, in the southern part of it. There are 2,000 species of vascular plants, many of which need pollinators like bees and 700 species of bees. And globally, this map shows you exactly where bees are most diverse and the darker red color shows where there are more species of bees. So. You can see that much of North America, especially here, is a biodiversity hotspot for bees. And biodiversity hotspots are a wonderful place to live, as we all know. It is also the term biodiversity hotspot is not a badge of honor. It is not just the number of endemic species and the number of species as a whole, but is also the number of species that are threatened. So they must be um, prioritized for conservation efforts. And that's how the term biodiversity hotspot was formed. And that's particularly prevalent here because um, we've seen land use change happen rapidly in San Diego. And here's some historic aerial imagery of San Diego County. This is Lake Murray. Um, and keep an eye on these yellow boxes uh, to see what happens the, and this is imagery from 2022. So this has all been developed and created fragmented areas of land. And even though this plant community is very similar to what's found here, I'll get into what Dr. James Hung's research found, that they do not host the same type of bee species and certainly not the same numbers of bee species. And land use change is one of the number one drivers of biodiversity loss globally. And uh, that's exactly what James Hung came here to do his PhD on. And he found um, at these 14 sites spread across San Diego, some very clear patterns that in these um, darker boxes represent large reserves like Mission Trails or Cabrillo National Monument had a higher diversity of bees and also a higher diversity of these traits that I talked about. So, so, so sociality, diet, where they nest, and these fragments, despite having the same plant community, had lower both uh, functional diversity and species diversity. And that's where I come in. My big question as a PhD student is why is this happening after Dr. James Hung uh, demonstrated this very clear pattern? And one of the main things that I'm interested in is looking at the range size. So in this biodiversity hotspot, we have a large number of endemic species and species that will only live in very small areas, um, such as this red-tailed micro short face bee here. This is the only area in the world that this species of bee is found, versus this tripart sweat bee is found all over Western North America. And my thought is that these bees that have a more flexible um, living strategy will be more um, they, they won't be as susceptible to land use change. And that is what our data shows so far. So there are, this is another figure similar to the ones you saw earlier, but with species richness. So number of species on the y-axis and year that we sampled. 
and um, reserves are in green and fragments are in gray. And we found that there are more of these range restricted species like the micro short face bee in reserves versus the fragments. So um, the we see that bees that are endemic are the first to drop out in response to land use change. And maybe part of the reason is due to their pollen requirements. And to think about how much pollen is needed to support native bees versus honeybees, um, some scientists in Utah calculated just how much pollen is needed. So here is a honeybee with a full load of pollen and six of these pollen pellets are estimated to need, needed to create one solitary bee. And this really demonstrates the size difference in a honeybee versus a solitary bee. Of course, they're not always so extreme. And um, the estimate was that one honeybee colony takes 650,000 of these pellets from one hectare per year. And that's equivalent to 110,000 solitary bees. So there hasn't been a lot of research to directly measure competition between honeybees and native bees, but we know that resources could be limiting for them. And that's something that Dr. Dylan Travis found uh, by looking at three of our native plants, white sage, black sage, and scorpion weed. And in these three plants, he selected a stem of flowers and he um, cross-pollinated them himself or he self-pollinated them himself with a paintbrush or he let a non-honeybee pollinate it or he just left it open. And for all of these species, except for black sage, what I'll get into, he found that the fitness of the plant, so basically how large the seed was after it was pollinated and how large of a plant grew from that seed that was planted. Those that were self-pollinated and honeybee pollinated were less fit um, versus it being cross-pollinated um, by hand or pollinated by a native bee. And this NA here for non-apis with black sage is because he collected his data during a severe drought and there were no non-apis bees to be seen. So I will pass it on to Patricia to talk more about native bees. Did we lose Patricia? Not sure. Patricia, you're muted right now. And your camera is also turned off. Maybe she had to run to the restroom really quickly. <laughs> and it happens to be right when you're ending. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hope everything's okay. It could be our computer's frozen. Well, let's go ahead and answer. Let's see if we can answer some of these questions here while we wait for Patricia to get back online. Um, uh, Gary had the question, what would be the best quick fact a park volunteer could tell visitors about the bees at Cabrillo National Monument? What do you think, Jess? I would, um, this is, this slide is the first thing that came to my mind actually. And that is that a bee that was, uh, that is endemic to San Clemente Island. Um, that means it's only on San Clemente Island and it has red hair like the bee that you see, um, was found at Cabrillo National Monument. And we have no idea why, if it just blew over or what, um, but Patricia found it. So it's pretty exciting. That is really exciting. And in fact, there is some great communication pieces about this. I know Patricia is about to speak on this, um, but Gary, uh, circle back with me. And we have, there's a beautiful story map um, that you can point people to if they wanna learn more about this bee. Um, and you know they weren't here at this talk tonight, for instance. Um, okay, so perfect. I think, Patricia, are you back with us? I am back. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see you, I can hear you, and okay. I'm going to let you take it away when you're ready. I do not know why, but I've lost all control on my side. 
So, <laughs> um, Jess, if you can assist me in advancing through the slides as we go along, that would be great. Okay. Um, so, um, let's learn about what uh, we see in terms of bees and in terms of plants at Cabrillo National Monument. Um, so, as Jess mentioned, um, in uh, um, at Cabrillo National Monument, we actually did a um, survey, not a survey, a bioblitz uh, in 2020, and uh, we found these um, uh, um, Anthophora urbana clementina, which is a species, a subspecies that's seen only on San Clemente Island normally. Um, and we found a population at on the coastal area at Cabrillo National Monument. Um, on these two pictures here, you can see uh, below is the very monochromatic um, mainland version of that species, which is uh, the urbane uh, digger bee. And the San Clemente version of that subspecies is very much red or orange. Um, so it is very um, distinguishable uh, from the mainland species. Uh, next. So we decided after this discovery to start um, bee surveys at Cabrillo National Monument. And um, it was also a perfect time to see how we could engage the community and use community science to do these surveys. Uh, normally the way the uh, surveys are done for monitoring bee species are collecting bees and euthanizing in them and um, looking at them under a microscope to be able to identify them to species. Uh, so it's a fairly invasive um, technique basically to the bee population. So we're trying to figure out ways to change that completely. Um, and we have a, a wonderful team of photographers that are surveying at Cabrillo National Monument uh, on uh, several transects. And we have a team of scientists also for the last three years that have been doing the same thing in order to, in collecting bees in order to identify them to species. Um, those um, collections are going to be stopping at this point, but the uh, photography surveys are going to be ongoing for as long as we can do them. Uh, and we're hoping to learn a lot about that. So that's really using community uh, science as a way to um, monitor bee populations. Next. Um, so since then, we've been cataloging... Um, the plant phenology of the park on these segments, on these four segments of the park, and also the native bee phenology. So the photographers go out and they go out for two hours and they record every plant that um, is in bloom and they record all the bees that they can, all the native bees that they can find. Um, so we know when plants are blooming. Uh, we know we're starting to know when bees are emerging, which species are, are, are emerging um, and when they're emerging. Um, sometimes it may have to do with the weather or some weather, weather events, could be the time of year, it could be it, whether or not their plant, their favorite plant is out or not. Um, we're learning how long they are active for. Um, some bees are only active in the spring, some, be some bees are only acting, um, active during the summer. Um, uh, some of them are very happy to be around in the winter time. Um, we're learning that not all species are being seen every year. Sometimes on drought years we don't see certain species. Um, we're learning about their pl plant preferences um, and their behavior. Um, their nesting behavior, mating behavior, and the uh, relationship between different species. Next. So the best way really to support native bees is to uh, plant native plants. I don't think I'm teaching anybody uh, anything by saying that. Um, of course, you know, my, my specialty is plants, but I have such a love for bees and I've been going around the park, taking a lot of photos of bees. So that's what you're gonna be seeing. You're gonna be seeing a lot of uh, bee photos and a, a few plants that I'm gonna be featuring. We're gonna go through the year 
uh, starting in January all the way to um, the fall uh, of the following year. Um, so what you want to do really um, for um, supporting the bees is to really have a wide diversity of plant in your yard. You don't have to have only natives. You can have other ornamental plants, uh, but you really want a big variety. Uh, difference in sizes of, of flowers, of shape of flowers, colors of flowers, and uh, a difference in um when they bloom. You want, a, if you possible, have blooms year round to support all these species. Next. I'm gonna start with the lemonade berry, which can get a bad rep um, just because it is it gets so big, especially at Cabrillo National Monument, you've all seen those hillsides covered with lemonade berry. So you can imagine if you plant a lemonade berry in your yard, is it gonna take over your yard? Possibly, but I'm here to tell you that you can actually plant a lemonade berry and tame it. Um, you can trim it so that it looks like a little tree. Uh, I've done some of that around the visitor center. There were some very wild lemonade berries and I um, have trimmed them so they look like a, a little shrub basically, or a little tree. Um, you can sculpt them the way you want um, so they can be tamed. And they are actually very important for bees at this time of year because there's not a whole lot of things blooming right now. The spring, our San Diego spring is just starting even though it's still winter. Um, we're starting to see blooms, but there's not a big abundance of things out there. But the lemonade berry is out there and it's blooming and it's attracting a lot of bees. Um, some of them are comfortable with um, colder weather uh, like mining bees and bumblebees. Um, but there's also uh, little bees out there that like to be around and like to enjoy the small flowers of uh, lemonade berries. Next. The uh, sea dahlia. Uh, it's a favorite at Cabaret National Monument, of course. Um, so the sea dahlia is in the sunflower family. And um, all the flowers in the sunflower family the disc that you see inside, what we think of as the flower, the center, and then the petals radiating from there, the center is really a collection of flowers. So in that center, because the Cidalia is so big, can you still see me? Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, good. Sorry, my screen disappeared all of a sudden, so <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> um, so the um, all these collection of little flowers, there's a, a, a lot on a sea dahlia and the bees are able to um, eat uh, from all these single flowers. So there's a lot of food um, on a single um, flower or on, I should say, a head of a sunflower or of a sea dahlia. Uh, they're very big. They're very showy. Um, they're very easy to maintain in a yard. Once you have sea dahlias, they'll keep coming back year after year, unless the gophers eat the roots. That's another problem, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and a, again, a lot of vari variety of bees. All these photos are photos that I have taken. Um, probably 95% of them are at Cabrillo National Monument, certainly for the sea dahlia here. They're all from um, Cabrillo. Um, Small bees, big bees, very different species out there um, are really enjoying the sea dahlia. And um, if we go to the next slide, we can also see that the sea dahlia is a great place for bees to hang out. Um, one very fun thing about native bees is that they like to, some of them like to hang um, on petals or on stems using just their mandibles. They don't use their legs, they just clip the petals or the stem with their mandibles and they just hang there. Sometimes they sleep that way. Um, so this was a little, um, on a coastal trail, a little um, cellophane cuckoo bee that was just swaying in the wind, preening itself, just hanging onto that uh, petal right there. Uh, very cute. Uh, still on a coastal trail, there was a sleepy bee slumber party of these longhorn bees that um, uh, were sleeping on a, that's a, a, a wilted head of a sea dahlia. 
but that coloring provided perfect camouflage for these longhorn bees to just hang there and sleep there. It was early in the morning, it was still cold, and they were all sleeping on that uh, flower head, just happy to hang there. Um, and just last year, there were a lot of these short-faced bees um, still on the coastal trail that were just sleeping in the morning on the um, sea dahlia flowers. Um, not a very good camouflage for them, but that's okay. <laughs> um they were very happy to be there and that's one of their favorite flowers to um forage from so they love that patricia uh, may i ask a yeah. clarifying question right now yes absolutely um and this is from one of the the listeners here um mm -hmm. they're wondering if we, we are looking at a wintering species right now so sea dahlia bloom in the wintering mm -hmm. in the winter okay perfect thank you it's uh, when you say wintering species, what do you mean? I just, just mean the... when they're blooming. Oh yeah, they're when blooming. We're going blooming. through the year. So, so the sea dahlias are just starting to bloom right now. The lemonade berry, um, started at earlier in January and keep, Perfect. it's going to keep blooming through March and we're going to go through and we're still moving through the year. So if we go to the next one, we are at the bladder pod. And if you've been around the park lately, it's just barely starting. Uh, we're talking more so in March, we're probably gonna see more blooms of the bladder pod. But the amazing thing that we've learned from actually our bee surveys um, is that some bladder pod plants, like a single plant, can stay in bloom for up to eight months. And that was absolutely mind blowing for me to see that. I had just not never noticed that a plant could stay in bloom for so long. Um, it doesn't happen every year, but we've um, uh, on one of the drought years that we had, we had a single plant on the coastal trail that um, was in bloom the entire time we did the surveys from March to September. Uh, so that was pretty mind blowing. Um, the bladder pod is one of these whimsical plants. Um, it might not smell the best. It kind of smells like skunk if you rub against it. Uh, but it's actually uh, such a beautiful plant um, and has very sweet nectar. So a lot of bees love to uh, go in there. There's also ants sometimes that likes to that like to go uh, and collect the um, nectar from these plants. But the anthers of um, bladder pod are perfect for little tiny bees. Um, you can see on the um, right hand side right there, uh, a metallic sweat bee very small and it just it's the perfect size it's the exact same size as the anther so it's the perfect size for, for it um, for the larger bees um they will um if you don't want to go to the next slide for the larger bees um a lot of the time they will go directly and sit the nectar inside um the conical flower um but some of some of the other bees will also go to the anthers. They they get creative. Um, you can see that sweat bee at the very bottom there. That black sweat bee is just wrapping itself all around the the anther right there. Um, a beautiful plant to have. Um, next, so we're moving on now to uh, May June. Uh, in May, you're going to have the Dudleyes that are going to start blooming. The ladyfinger on the right is going to be blooming a little later than the others, um, but uh, probably more so in June. But in May, you're going to start seeing the two others. Uh, one of the favorite, the chalk Dudleya. It is beautiful um, early on uh, in the spring, and then it blooms, and then the plant itself will start to wilter and, and fade away. So it's not, I don't consider it an evergreen, so it's not necessarily the best for the garden, but it does have a spectacular bloom and it attracts a lot of insects and hummingbirds. Uh, but so does the landsleaf dudleya, and the landsleaf dudleya is more of an evergreen. That plant is gonna be beautiful year round um, and then bloom at around the same time as well. Uh, next. So some of the bees, that you're going to see on the Dudleyes, again, some bees are going to be very, very small. They will actually go all the way inside 
the flower and completely disappear. You don't see them. Um, they bathe in there and then come out. <laughs> and then you have bees that have much longer tongs like the uh, digger bee that will just hover at the um, opening of the flower and uh, and get their um, nectar or pollen uh, from there. Next. The toyon. The toyon is a, another favorite of mine and of just about anybody actually in San Diego. <laughs> uh, that's probably my favorite shrub um, in uh, around Christmas time, of course, you know, there's red berries and green leaves, you know, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, but it also has the particularity of blooming a little later in June or July. Uh, so you will be seeing some um, uh, a lot of bees that are enjoying the small flowers. My one of my favorite bees to see on Toyons um, is the Rus fairy bee. Um, that's going to be on the right hand side there. Um, you can see little um, uh, the little male on the back there who's following the female. Um, I have. Toyon's here at my house and I see these bees. I have hundreds of these bees of the uh, Rose Fairy Bee. They're just absolutely adorable. They're difficult to see because they're very, very small. They look more so like gnats if you're not really paying attention. But um, if you have Toyon's in your yard or if you're going around the park uh, at, a, at a time where uh, we have beautiful Toyon's around the visitor center, do pay close attention to them and then you'll see, you'll start seeing those little tiny bees. Very cute. And it is a bird magnet. Um, it actually feeds the birds in the winter time. So it's a, um, absolutely an incredible plant to have for biodiversity in your yard. Um, it attracts insects and it attracts birds. Um, this is possibly the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful birds here that we see in San Diego County. Uh, and is here only in the winter time, and that's the cedar waxwing. And they absolutely gobble up the Toyon palms. They just love those. Next. The chaparral bushmallow, as Adam said, it's great to see bees sleep in those little flowers, uh, sometimes early in the morning uh, when that plant is in bloom, which is gonna be in July, August, um, it's a summer bloomer. Um, you can actually find little bees sleeping in the bushmallow flowers. Um, the other particularity about the bushmallow is that it attracts a one of our specialist bees, the um, Ocracious chimney bee. Um, that bee will only visit um, chaparral bushmallow. It does not visit any other plants. Um, and that happens for other bees um, and other plants uh, that are at the park that are very, very picky about the plants they love. Uh, so that's that's one of them right there. And it's it's a beautiful bee. If you can see the eyes, the blue eyes there, oof, and the fuzzy, the fuzziness of it, you just want to cuddle with it. <laughs> Next. Um, California buckwheats. Uh, again, that's another summer bloomer, uh, very important for for later in the summer. Now you're having all the the um, animals uh, that were out in the spring and the early spring blooms have faded away. So we're entering a time uh, where we don't have a lot of variety of blooms uh, in the middle of the summer. A lot of our plants go dormant in the summertime. Uh, but that's when the um, California buckwheat decides to uh, to bloom. And as a result, it attracts quite a few bees. It has very small flowers. The anthers are absolutely beautiful. There's little um, uh, pink anthers. Um, it has yellow pollen. If you look at the legs of these bees, some of the legs of these bees, the pollen is actually yellow. For a long time, people thought the pollen was uh, probably pink because of the anther color, but no, it is yellow. Um, uh, and a lot of bees rely on that. If you go to the next slide, that's how many bees like the um, California buckwheats. 
Uh, a lot of diversity of species. Again, when blooms of other things are more scarce, um, they start really relying on those power um, power plants. That's that's what I like to call them arriving at the end of the summer and then going into the fall. We're really looking at plants that really sustain our um, uh, that are really essential to sustain our pollinators. Um, and on that note, let's go to the next slide. The golden bush. So I kind of put golden bush and um, uh, backers, broom backers in the same boat because uh, they bloom at around the same time. Uh, but I find that golden bush attracts a lot of bees, a lot of variety of bees. Um, there's, uh, if you look on the uh, right hand side on the top there, uh, the leaf cutter bees there have the particularity of um, collecting pollens on their belly. This one is particularly proud of its belly. Um, it has a lot of pollen on there. Uh, it's quite impressive. Um, so the bushmallow is going to be blooming in the fall, uh, starting in September, October, November. Uh, so it's one of these really late season bloomers, and um, it will attract a great diversity of um, pollinators. Um, if you go to the next one. Um, again, a lot of different species. Um, this is one of the plants that we found our San Clemente urbane digger bee uh, in a coastal area. Um, that was a plant that it visited. Uh, that was actually a plant uh, it collected pollen from, uh, which sort of confirmed that we had a population at the park uh, because that's a behavior that a female would exhibit uh, before laying eggs. Um, so, uh, possible nesting behavior. Um, and um, again, a lot of variety of um, bees on these flowers. The metallic sweat bee in the very center that has a red abdomen, that is um, the only plant I've seen this bee on. I think it goes on other, it's not a specialist per se, but because of the, maybe the time of year that it emerges at, um, the the um, uh, golden bush is definitely a favorite for that bee. All right, next. Ah, the last one, um, again, uh, talking about fall. Um, this almost goes all the way to December, um, the wire lettuce. Now, I'm talking about the wire lettuce today because it's one of these, one of the most overlooked plants out there. Um, it is an annual uh, plant. So it's very rare for annual plants to bloom that late in the season. Um, it has a very ugly um, spring, summer um, phase. Uh, if you look on the bottom left, uh, it looks like a weed, really. It's a very weedy plant. But then it, it's kind of like the ugly duckling. It grows into this beautiful, whimsical plant. Sometimes it's closer to the ground and sometimes it's taller. Um, it's very difficult to take a picture of that plant um, as a whole because you can see right through it. it the branching is very sparse um, and the flowers are little snowflakes basically on this branching. Um, it's one of the, um, that's the, probably the second uh, most popular plant at the park after um, the Shaw's agave. When the Shaw's agave is in bloom, everybody's asking me about the Shaw's agave. When this is in bloom, everybody asks me about it and stops me and, and says, what is this plant, this magical plant? Um, so it's it's a little bit of a shame that you can't really find this plant in nurseries. Um, um, I haven't been able to find it at least. Um, I'm hoping that people are gonna be paying more attention to it. And one of the reason for that is, next slide, um, bees. <laughs> this is the plant I see the most amount of bee diversity on. So if everybody could plant some Stephan Stephanomeria or wire letters, in their backyard, uh, we'd be supporting an amazing array of bees. And when I say it's very popular, I mean it's very popular. 
Next slide. It's very popular. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 incredible. It's like it's almost as if you know you'd want to say, okay, what species does not like Stephanomeria? And and it it'd be a a, a, a shorter answer. Um, it is one of the most popular plants uh, for bees um, out there. Um, next, so uh, another thing that you can do in your backyard. These are just a few tips. Um, is to keep some bare soil for your nesting bees. Um, there is often um, one of the most popular questions uh, uh, that I get is, is there a, grand, a, a native ground cover, uh, year round ground cover that I can put in my backyard? Um, and the short answer is no, we have some seasonal ground covers um yeah in in san diego but like a year-round ground cover not really uh not a native one and um it's okay because guess what bees need bare soil in order to nest um so it's okay if you have bare soil in your yard in between your stepping stones you're actually supporting bee that biodiversity by living it be living bee <laughs> all right next um also, be careful when you're trimming. Um, we're, Jess was talking about the pebble bees earlier. Um, do you may find those structures um, on your branches. So just look at your branches before you cut. Um, and uh, pebble bees can also be on structures. Um, in this case, uh, that's uh, on the window frame. Um, so if you see something like this, just know that you know, before you start trying to wipe it out and clean it up, this may be actually a very um, interesting bee that lives there, uh, the pebble bees. Um, also with the stems of the annual plants that I have in my backyard, um, not only Stephanomeria, which is the stem that's on the right here, uh, but with other types of stems, I tend to cut the um, flowers at the very top and then I leave the stems in place. Uh, and that allows bees, like the small car carpenter bee, to um, actually find a home um, in, in those stems. The, there's a lot of other insects that love to bury in those stems. So um, that's, uh, that's a good thing to just not get rid of everything of all the brush that you have uh, in your yard and just leave some of that um, bee for everybody. Next. So you can help uh, by, um, you can do some research if you would like uh, with the San Diego uh, or the, the San Diego chapter of the California Native Plant Society. They're a great resource uh, for plants. Uh, they have events and lectures throughout the year. Um, and also a few nurseries that we have here in San Diego, um, Native West, uh, they just opened a um store for um that's not wholesale they used to be a wholesale nursery but now they actually have a store for people for individuals and uh, musa creek which is a little further but musa creek you can actually go on their website and see what they have the availability that they have and um send them an email and tell them which nursery you would like to uh, them to ship the plants to and they will actually ship them there and you can pick it up from your local nursery um, and then there's also Neil's Nursery. I've never been there, but um, I've heard great things. Uh, it's a small nursery in Encinitas as well. And uh, Jess, if you want to take it over. All right. So more ways to help is to document what you see. And my favorite way to do that is with the app iNaturalist. Um, there are lots of folks around in San Diego who love to do this. So you might meet a friend out on the trail. Um, and it's an app that you can put on your phone and you can take pictures of what you see, upload it and um, identify it yourself with the AI and then have experts come and confirm. And you're adding to what we know about biodiversity. So it's fun for you and it benefits um, what we know about biodiversity. And another way to uh, help, maybe it's like tomorrow and it might rain um, and you want to still help with documenting biodiversity, you can help digitize museum records. So there's this great project called Notes from Nature, Big Bee Bonanza. 
and uh, they digitize, they take these pictures of their specimens and all of the labels, and you get to type in all of the information that's found on the label, and then that record um, goes up on a map to these big data aggregators that tell us which species are found where. And to give you an idea of how important that work is, this is a map that shows where there are records of specimens that have been digitized. And all of the areas that are white are areas where there are no digitized records. So maybe some of them, there are specimens just waiting on notes from nature for you to, um, to digitize. And uh, the most important thing is to keep learning about bees. My favorite starting point is to go to this virtual museum exhibit, Museum of the Earth. Um, if you just Google Museum of the Earth and bees, it will pop right up and it will tell you everything and more you ever wanted to know about bees. Um, and some of my favorite books, Bees in Your Backyard. Uh, this is a really great guide with tons of beautiful photos of bees to help you learn about their life history and how to find them. The Solitary Bees is, is kind of a textbook and teaches you all about the, the nitty gritty of solitary bees. Bees of the World is a great book and um, it's kind of a coffee table book. There are some amazing photos to just put out and on your coffee table and oogle at. And if you would like a novel about um, what it's like to be out in the field as a field biologist, Dave Golson has written a number of them. And a Sting in the Tail is one of my favorites. Um, and thank you. And we would love to take any questions. And Patricia and I compiled a list of resources for you to keep learning about bees. So you can scan this code and we can also send the link in the chat for you to see a long list of all of those things. So thanks everyone. Well, thank you, Patricia and Jess. That was really informative. Um, I also love how proactive you are with giving people resources to learn more and also to help because that's always the, one of the number one questions, right? Is how can we help? Um, so thank you so much for that advice. I learned a lot tonight. Um, and I know you've been an answering questions just um, kind of as we've been going along. So currently, I don't think we have any questions in the Q&A. Um, we do have to log off in just a few minutes, but if folks have any last minute questions they'd like to put either in the chat or in the Q&A, now is your time to do so. Um, and before we log off, while you're maybe thinking of that last question and typing it out, um, I'd like to kind of end here with a fun question. Um, Jess, what is your favorite bee or plant or both and why? Um, <clears throat> my favorite bee is a wool carter bee. And um, I, I really, I had a fun experience watching a, a male protect his patch of flowers in the field once and uh, just watching this behavior of a bee that it, it doesn't, the male doesn't even have a sting. And that gets at a question that someone asked earlier, and he doesn't really have anything to fight with, but he scares all of these big wasps away with their sting. So I really enjoy them. So wool carter bees in the genus Anthidium, they're my favorite. <laughs> that is amazing. Does he, um, what does he do to scare them away? He doesn't have a stinger, so. He flies at them really quickly and he kind of, um, he ha can make a sound with his wings that is kind of like a loud hum that's big and like, get out of my way. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. He's puffing up. Like, come at yeah. me, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's fabulous. Okay. Patricia, same question for you. Favorite bee, favorite yeah. plant. It's just um, not fair. Both or why? I know. Just choose know. one that you love. It doesn't have to be um, your all time favorite. Just your favorite tonight. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, say that one of my favorite bee is the, um, that San Clemente bee that I found at Cabaret National Monument, just because of the monumental um, search we had to do to, you know, or research we had to do to figure out whether or not we had a population, you know, once, uh, once I found that bee, it was uh, pretty amazing. And I had the, the opportunity that year there were, there was a lot of wire letters out there. Um, so we really had to um, look at a lot of, of wire letters and found an incredible amount of bees on these on these late very late blooming plants um 
and that was absolutely fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to go with these two, Stefano Maria, Wire Lettuce, and the San Clemente Bee. That's wonderful. You have a personal connection to that bee. Yes. <laughs> um, Alyssa wants to know if this, this is recorded. Alyssa, it is in fact being recorded and that will be up on Cabrillo's website as well as Cabrillo National Monument Foundation's website um, once we get that captioned. Um, and um, we won't be sending that out, the, the recording out, but you can look for it on our website um, momentarily in just a few days, right? Should be up. Um, likewise, I did want to mention that, you know, that that famous bee biologist that we were talking about, the entomologist, Dr. James Hung. Um, we did a naturally speaking with him a while back, and that is also recorded and put up on our website, which you can access now. So if you want to keep learning about uh, native bees, that's one of the resources that you can go ahead and, and refer to now. Um, I want to join everyone here tonight and thank you um, so much for your expertise and your time. And thank you all for attending tonight's talk. Um, there will be another one of these talks at the end of February. I don't have the title yet, um, but we've got uh, Kay London talking about the wildlife of San Diego County, um, which I'm very excited about. And um, so stay tuned, look for the on the website for when the information of when that will be. Um, and we hope to see you then. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank Bye. you. Take care now.